Greetings, everyone. Thanks for tuning in to another episode of Topic UFO. Tonight, uh, we're going to be speaking with Mr. Brett Oldham. And uh, Brett uh, has had an interesting life, to say the least. And he is going to be telling us about that. And he also has a, a new book that came out uh, in April of last year entitled Children of the Greys. And uh, definitely want to hear what that's all about. So I think what we'll do, without further ado, we're just going to go ahead and bring Brett on. Uh, Brett, are you out there, sir? I'm here, Rick. Uh, how are you doing tonight? Uh, doing great. Doing great. Thank you so much for uh, taking the time out of your day to come to speak with us. Well, it's my pleasure. I'm glad to be here. Uh, I, I want to tell the viewers uh, this coincidence type of story. Uh, I was uh, watching television a couple of weeks ago on uh, Destination America Channel, and uh, there was a show on there where they talk about uh, UFOs and, and, and different things. And uh, there was this gentleman on there who was talking about his experiences. And uh, I quickly pressed the record button because I said, oh, I got to get this guy on the show. And you may not believe this, but three days later, maybe at the max, I get an email from the gentleman that was on the show that I was watching on TV. Uh, and that's Brett. So Brett, what uh, can you tell us about this uh, episode you did and, and, and how that went? Yeah, we, um, it, the show's called Monsters and Mysteries in America. It's on the, the Destination America channel. Uh, it's a new series. And um, we, we just aired our episode, which was the, uh, the finale of the season. Um, a couple of weeks ago, and I think they're, they're already starting to show repeats of it. We went out to Vegas. Uh, I'm from, uh, not originally, but I lived in Las Vegas for over 20 years. And um, they were doing an episode um, on monsters and different kind of uh, paranormal events and stuff that happened in the desert. So uh, that's where some of my uh, abduction experiences have taken place. So they flew my wife and I uh, out to Las Vegas, and we filmed out there in December. And um, they covered um, a little bit of the beginning of my abduction experiences, starting when I was five years old. And they, uh, the main, the main thing they were covering was uh, an episode that I had that uh, in the late '80s uh, with uh, an ex-girlfriend of mine, and I were living together, and. We had uh, been awakened in the night by a loud bang. We woke up um, to see, I saw four, she saw three because one was blocked from her view, uh, gray aliens, the grays as they're typically called, uh, uh, surrounding us. And um, we were taken together. Um, we were taken aboard the craft. At the time, she was uh, about a week shy of being four months pregnant. Uh. And um, they put us on separate tables. Uh, of all my, I've been having abduction experiences uh, since I was five years old. And uh, of all the times I've been taken, which is uh, a multitude of times, I've never seen this many uh, of them together. And they were surrounded my table and they were surrounding hers and she was over by some equipment. But they had her up um, basically same way, uh, like stirrups and stuff. As, as a OBGYN would do. Right. And they were removing the fetus from her. Um, I realized what was happening at the time. Uh, basically, I was helpless to do anything about it because of the control that these uh, creatures have over you. And um, I tried to, I was able to move my head, but nothing else. And they had left the right side of my body open. So giving me a clear view on purpose, it seemed like. And I, I did turn my head away. Um, she was she was screaming, please don't take my baby, please stop, and, and, and hysterical, as you might imagine. And um, I, I was screaming at them, too. I turned my head away. I didn't want to watch it anymore because I realized what was happening. And uh, one of them came around the top of the table and put his hand over the top of my head and uh, turned my head back to the right again, uh, forcing me to watch it. 
And then uh, the next morning, we um, when we we woke up, um, she immediately had spotted like um, traces of blood on the bed on the sheets and. She got up and she went to the bathroom and she yelled out from the bathroom, the master bath, that uh, I better call the doctor because she was bleeding. So I, I did, and we were only about 15 minutes down the road from from uh, her doctor, and he they told us to to rush up there, which we did, and um, you know, he quickly examined her and, and said, um, you know, we, we it looks like uh, that you've lost a baby. We're going to have to do a it was a procedure called a DNC, and. So they took her to the hospital, which was directly across the street, and my mother uh, showed up, and her mother showed up, and um, the doctor came out, really with this puzzled look on his face, and he says, well, I've never seen anything like this before, and he says, I don't understand it, but um, there was nothing in the womb whatsoever. Somebody had already cleaned the womb out. Uh. Um, he said, you know, being that far along uh, in the pregnancy that there should have been, even with a normal miscarriage, there should have been some kind of tissue left in there. And he said the womb was completely clean. It was like this woman was never pregnant. And he says, I know better because she was just in my office. I, I believe it was four or five days before that she had been in his office and had an exam. And, uh, and he was just he was just total stunned by it. And my mom uh, heard that. And actually, Dustin, uh, the Mr. Monsters and Mysteries uh, interviewed her as well. Um, as to what she had witnessed to the doctor saying that, and they we, we were able to find uh, the girl that I'm talking about. I hadn't spoken to her in at least 15 years, and I wasn't uh, all I had uh, talked to her before that we did the television show was, "Did you do you remember this?" Because after it happened, uh, we were both just. We, we had both talked about it. We had, both of us had remembered what had happened the night before. And, and it was just one of those things. We were just kind of like in, in, in shock. And, um, you know, we just, we just knew that what had happened, there was nothing we could do about it. And we just kind of let it go. And we, we talked about it briefly a couple more times, but, um, that was it. And she told me that she did remember it and that she still li basically lives in fear of, of them coming back and sleeps with the light on to this day. She goes to bed, and uh, she agreed to to uh, to be interviewed. So uh, I had no idea at the time, like what details that she did remember about it. Um, and what, they interviewed us at separate times, um, at separate locations. And when they got done interviewing her, I asked the uh, the uh, director, uh, you know, how how it went. And he says, "Well, you know, she backed up your story one hundred percent." So uh, I and, tell you. Um I saw, uh, I saw her, you know, giving her her interview part, and uh, you could just tell by the look on her face that uh, this was still very much affecting her. Uh, I guess she's kept it a secret all this time. I guess up till just now when she did that interview, is, is that correct? As far as I know, um, I mean, I, I did the same thing. Um, you know, I, I've had these abduction experiences. I, I wasn't aware of them um, until my 20s, and I began having anxiety attacks for absolutely no reason. I mean, I was an athlete when I was younger. I've been a musician my whole life, uh, you know, played thousands of shows. Uh, used to, <laughs> not the type of person that really gets anxiety attacks. And um, I started having severe anxiety attacks, which I had to get therapy for. And through the therapy, and um, I, I never got regressed, you know, like, some people do for abduction experiences, but uh, I did I, I did get into therapy and, and started learning relaxation techniques and, and, and medica uh, medication uh, meditation. <laughs> <laughs> Big difference. Freudian slip there, or uh, well, yeah, may, I, I don't know. I, they probably I probably needed medication, but I'm kind of a, one of those holistic type of people, so I don't like to take medication. But understood. I was joking. I was joking. Yeah, and uh, and that's what surfaced. I mean, what what started what started coming out was uh, the memories of all the abductions and um, really for the next two years um, they, they just kept surfacing uh, sometimes in dreams sometimes just as conscious memories or, or flashbacks and uh, eventually I, I started remembering it just a tremendous amount of stuff so that's why I, I, I even at that time though I mean I st I'm like her I mean I, I, I kept it a secret there was just only 
two or three people that knew. Um, even my wife, um, for the first two years that we were married, you know, I didn't tell her. Oh, is so, that right? Yeah, it was just something that was just, um, it was so traumatic. And, and one of the reasons that I, that I came out with the book was I, I felt it was time to let the public know that this is a, a real thing. It's happening on a grand scale. I mean, ever since the show aired and the books came out, I've got contacted from people like just all over the place from all walks of life having these experiences and too afraid of, of ridicule to, to talk to it, talk to anybody about it. And, and that's the kind of thing that I, I want people, I want to be able to help people. I, don't, I suffered in silence for over 20 years uh, once this came out. And um, it's just a, it's a lonely existence to live with this kind of uh, psychological trauma um, because it does, it does do that. And anybody that says it doesn't is, is not, yeah. not, ex- not, not in full acceptance of it. Well, let, let me ask you, Brett, um, did the writing of the book, and, and let me make a correction here right off the bat, because I think I said that the book came out April of last year, but it was April of this year, correct? Yeah, correct. Yeah. Oh, okay. So April, 2013, it came out. That's, it's a recent release. Okay. Okay. I wanted to make sure I got that right. Now, did the process of writing the book, uh, was it therapeutic to you as far as helping you to get, you know, some of that weight off your shoulders? It was very much so. Um, and actually, it was one of your former guests uh, and a contributor to the book, Sandy Nichols, uh, and my wife, uh, Gina, who, who both kind of uh, talked me into doing it. Uh, I thought about it, you know, for a while because I just uh, to myself, I want people to know. I, I have so many memories and a lot more and a lot to offer and, and stuff that's never been said publicly before that I know of. And um, and and I felt that by doing that, um, I could bring more awareness to the public and also maybe give strength and, and comfort to uh, other abductees. And Sandy himself is an abductee, and you know he kind of encouraged me, and and so did Gina. And so finally, I, I just started writing, and it was very therapeutic. And uh, although it took me almost two years to write the book, because once I started reliving, uh, putting it putting it to paper, you know, pen to paper, it's not really pen to paper, but metaphorically speaking, um, it, it, and you start re- kind of reliving the stuff, um, it, it, it sent me into depression several times, and I had to stop and kind of gain my strength again and um, and get through it. And then I got to a certain point where I was like okay, I'm going to finish it. And, and that's what happened. But uh, it, in the end, when it got up, when it was finished and everything was done, it was very therapeutic. And I'm, I'm glad I did it. Now, um, how many abduction uh, scenarios do you think you've had over your lifetime? Uh, any, well, any guess? They, they go in spurts. Uh, it's still happening to this day. Uh, as I've gotten older, it's it's slacked off. Um, you know, there were times when it was just real frequent, uh, in my, especially in my 20s and, and 30s. Um, you know, I, I probably talk about uh, a, a good dozen of them or more in the book, uh, just covering the different aspects of what, what is experienced when they do have you. And it, it really covers, uh, you know, a wide variety of things. People think, oh, you, you know, they they take you and they just kind of give you a little physical checkup or something. And it, it goes way beyond that. And, uh, so I, and I wanted to cover that aspect of it. And, um, the, the, the experiments that they've done, um, the medical procedures and, you know, I've got, uh, I even included like a couple of my, my brother was like an award winning, uh, Jeffrey Oldham's a award winning artist in Las Vegas. And I got him to do a couple of sketches that are very detailed. And, um, I, I included, I've got, some unexplainable scars, uh, which I go into the book about, you know, where a doctor's asked me when I had back surgery and I, I never have had back surgery and things like that. Uh, I've got puncture, puncture mark scars. And I, I took pictures and included that in the book. And, you know, I laid it all out there and, and some of it's really kind of embarrassing to, to put out to the public, but I wanted to be, I wanted it all to be out there and, and told and tell people this is the kind of stuff that goes on. And this is the kind of stuff that you're subjected to. It's, it's, uh, you know, it's embarrassing to do, but it's not, it's, it's nothing I did on my own accord. I mean, everything that's, that they do to people, 
there's no way to stop them. It's I mean, a, they're, they're, their mental power is beyond anything we can even comprehend. Yeah, it's against your will. That's for sure, right? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. What, so uh, now that you've gone through these things uh, for the majority of your life, uh, what do you think they want? What are they doing here? Do well, you, I think there's more than one uh, species that, that – is visiting Earth and ha and and uh, and have for millenniums, but um, as far as the grays, um, you know, to me, uh, there's well, there's two kinds. There's a, there's tall ones and there's small ones. I really believe the small ones are uh, they pretty much have a hive mentality, and I really think that there's a good possibility that they were create created by the tall ones. I think there could be a biological robots. Uh, they all look very similar. They act very similar. Their their whole thought process is based entirely on logic. They're very very matter of fact, you know, uh, de completely devoid of emotion. Um, the tall ones have been, uh, even from the very beginning, I mean, I was taken, and my very first time as a five-year-old child, I was taken to a tall one who, who I, I knew right even at that time was a leader. And he, he was the one that befriended me and still all these years is the one that has been the nicest, if there's such a, if that's the proper term. Uh, I mean, he himself has never to my to my memory to my knowledge uh, inflicted any he may have ordered but you know he's never been the one there doing it and so he's always kind of been that sort of fatherly figure or you know the the person that's will will talk back will answer some questions sometimes depending on what the question is um, and so you know they, they they set it up like that uh, their agenda I believe for the grays anyway that is creating the hybrids. Uh, that's what uh, I based the book on, Children of the Greys. Uh, after the incident with the fetus was taken, uh, two to three years after that, I, I uh, on a subsequent abduction, uh, was taken by two small greys to a large room. It was very dimly lit, which is unusual. And, um, and they left me there alone. I didn't really exactly know what was going on. They wouldn't uh, answer any questions. And there was a ramp about maybe 75 feet in front of me, I mean, down uh, long in front of me. And at the end of the ramp was um, like a, a lit doorway type thing. And, and the, But the light wasn't really filtering into the room um, that, that I was in. They seemed to be able to control the light like we, ha we don't, we can't do with our technology. But, um, and then from that light, uh, I seen, um, uh, a, a female hybrid, a figure started walking up the ramp and she was carrying something. I couldn't see what at first. And as she got closer, I could see that it was uh, a small child who was also a hybrid and it was a, a female as well. And she uh, set the child down. You know, I would guess it was uh, maybe a, somewhere between a two, three, four year old child uh, as far as referencing to a human child. And um, told me that the child was mine, wanted me to interact with it, which I refused at first. But the longer that it went on and the more I looked at the little girl, um, she, she looked strange. But at the same time, she had sort of a softness in her eyes. And, and uh, she never communicated anything with me. But um, I knelt down and I started kind of talking to her like you would a child here. And, um, you know, she seemed to enjoy it. And we... I sort of sort of bonding with her, right. strange, strangely enough, and I, I don't know if it was uh, the fetus that was taken. Uh, you know, they've taken sperm from me numerous times. Uh, it might not even have been had anything to do with me, uh, but I did feel a connection to it, oddly enough. And uh, then she took her away, just real sudden. I, I never got her name. Um, you know, I, I've never been be able to see her again, and I kind of, I kind of regret that actually i wish that uh i always wonder what happened to her and, and who she was and that type of thing but they'll do those kind of uh, cruel emotional things to you on a pretty frequent basis but now, that's uh, the basis of the book is about it you know is the hybrid system and, and actually the cover of the book is a very close um uh rendering of what i saw uh, that my brother jeff created for me and um the little you know, girl the little girl. I wanted, I wanted right. her on the cover, you know, and I want and and I wanted people to see what she looks like. And uh, but they they seem to be very interested in uh, uh, us as a physical specimen. I mean, they're very frail. 
we're not. And uh, also our emotional makeup, you know, what makes us tick. Um, and, and, they'll, and, and it runs the gamut of all, all the emotions that they can elicit from you. And then human sexuality and not so much just the re- reproductive part of it, but the emotions behind it. You know, um, love, love, maybe, I don't know, love, desire, all of it, you know, um, and, and, and so they, they will, uh, you know, they've subjected me to that. Um, you know, I've been in things where I've seen other, what I perceive to be humans involved as well, um, sort of in a catatonic state. Uh, and I, maybe I've been in a catatonic state and don't remember it as well, but these are the things that I, that I do remember. And it's all based around most of everything that they do is based around that. And I think they're using that um, because their hybrids uh, obviously consist of some of that and they need to learn about it. Well, Brett, let me ask you something. Um, have have these uh, two things. Number one, you said the tall grays actually communicated to you on a couple of occasions. Was this... Uh, uh, you know, through the mind type of communication, or was it verbal communication? And then, second of all, have they ever discussed where they're from with you? Well, it's always telepathic. It's been that that from from the beginning, and and really, uh, some of the uh, some of the early abductions. I mean, I, I didn't really get that. I would still make the mistake of like speaking out loud, and then I would kind of feel kind of foolish by it. But that's just what we're used to, and. Right. And, uh, but I, I quickly realized that, uh, you know, they can read every thought that we're thinking, um, which sometimes can go against you, but, um, I've, I've never asked them where they're from. Um, I, I'm not, I, I'm not even a hundred percent sure that they're from another planet. I mean, you know, I do, I think there's a dimensional interdimensional aspect to this. Right. And, uh, I, I do know that when they take me, uh, it's done dimensionally. Uh, I've seen it. Uh, it took me, a, I, I never knew exactly. I, I, I've heard people talk about other abductees talk about, well, I went through a wall and stuff like that. And that never happened to me. I would, I, I would see him sometimes where I was at. And then the next thing I, I would be black out and then I would wake up and I would be where they took me to. But, uh, a recent episode that happened, um, a couple of years ago that I heard it like a, a tap, tap, tap sound, um, uh, on, on the bed, which was at the time, I actually thought it was, uh, because these, my abductions have actually led me into the, the world of the paranormal, uh, because I had so many ghost experiences and stuff when I was a kid, which also has to do with this, uh, dimensional shift that happens to our bodies. Uh, and, um, so I, I, I kind of thought it was like a ghost and, uh, I heard it again, you know, this tap, tap, tap on the mattress. And so when I did open my eyes, um, I was laying on my side facing the, the outside of the bed and there was three of them lined up along the side of the bed and they seemed to be, they seemed to wake me up on purpose this time. But at the time I could see on the bedroom wall, what I can only describe looking like a, you know, like a water mirage, you know, it, it, it didn't, the, the texture and everything had changed and I would, it was oval shaped and around the oval there was, uh, about a foot of like this kind of milky white stuff and inside uh the oval i was seeing w- w- what i perceived to be into another dimension inside their craft i mean i could see inside what appeared to me to be as a craft and another gray in there wow. uh, so it seemed like that they had opened some sort of a dimensional portal and that's what they entered my room in and that's what they were probably taking me through I, I tend to think uh, that a lot of this stuff is definitely dimensional. Um, it just it just seems like a, a logical explanation to me. What, um, as, like you said, that that uh, these experiences you've had have has caused you to become extremely interested in other paranormal ghost hunting. Um, uh, cryptozoology. Now, I understand you had some type of run-in with Bigfoot. Um, or is I that actually, something you don't want to get into right now? 
No, no, it's it's fine. I can briefly tell you about it. It's um, I don't I don't really think it was anything related to uh, my abduction experiences, but I do think the uh, the 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 connection between uh, abductees and and ghost activity. Um, through my research, I found time and time again that going all the way back to Betty and Barney Hill, you know, Kathleen Martin, who's uh, one of the contributors in my book, you know, niece of Betty, uh, Betty Hill, and she even said that after after their uh, experience, they started experiencing paranormal activity around their house. So th- there's a definite connection there uh, with that. Briefly, uh, you know, my my thing with the Bigfoot sighting, I, I lived, I went to high school in Northeast Ohio, which is a Bigfoot hotspot. And uh, me and two of my friends had, uh, after school uh, one spring, decided to go check out this old abandoned house that everybody was telling us about. And, you know, there was a famous myth about it where they'd found this couple uh, dead in there and they had fear locked on their face. <laughs> you know, one of those things the high school kids talk Right, talking. right. And, uh, so we, we uh, went all these back roads and it went, got all the way down to like dirt roads. And then we started going down the dirt road and the, there was a log across the road and we kind of couldn't go anymore. So we hiked and we got up through there um, and heard a bunch of dogs barking, which we assumed were wild dogs because there was nothing really around there. So we... Uh, made little clubs uh, out of some tree branches and started hitting the trees. Well, unbeknownst to me at the time, that's a, a mode of communication for Bigfoot. Right. Um, you know, the tree banging. And so I, I, I guess we must have called it to us by doing that. We were just te- checking the sturdiness of the branches in case the dogs, wild dogs attacked us. So uh, we, we kind of stood still for a while and we heard the dogs kind of coming around the other side and we're like, well, we like back where the car was at and we're like well we can't go back that way we might run into them so we decided to kind of go around the long way we went through this big pine forest and and ended up getting lost basically and uh the sun started going down it started getting pretty dark and finally uh after meandering around for about an hour uh we were walking in single file i was walking first and uh, i found a deer trail and i knew there was a river close uh to the to one of the roads that we came in on so i knew the deer would be walking to the river to get get a drink at night and stuff. So I told the guys, let's just follow this deer trail. It's probably going to take us right into that one road and we can walk back up to the car. And we, uh, we happened to get pretty close to, uh, where there's a big opening right by the, where, where the road was. Um, and, uh, we was probably about, uh, maybe somewhere 30, 40 feet from, from the opening where we seen this clearing, which we thought was uh, where the road was. And, uh, I happened to see, uh, some kind of, thing I, you know it was white uh, actually and it was crouching down behind like some little sapling trees and some bushes and and um and i was trying to like i thought somebody was playing a joke on us or something but nobody really knew we were out there and then and they saw it too and then you know we're just like would you guys see that and that kind of thing like that i mean we were 17 years old so um it, it realized that well actually it reached up and grabbed a bunch of these bushes and and shook it profusely i mean it was like very aggressive and uh we just stood there we still know what what it was and i guess it realized it wasn't going to scare us off that way so it stood up and faced us and this thing was uh you know i'm i'm almost six feet four and this thing was a good at least two feet bigger than me wow um and we were standing there just it just turned around just face to face um and i didn't get a real good look at its face because of the way that you know it was a little bit too dark but it was the typical, you know, cone head, wide shoulders, long arms, but it was just humongous and standing near uh, 30, 40 feet in front of us. But um, it was it was the, fu- the fight or flight kind of thing kicked in. And I knew I, that I personally wasn't going to go running back into the woods where we've been lost for the last hour with this thing around. So I we all screamed, basically. And um, I, I remember like throwing my club at it, which was uh, I wouldn't do th- these days. But <laughs> as a scared teenager, that's what I did. And we had to run like r- literally right by it to the opening to get to the road. And the funny thing is, is, as we did, I remember like out of the corner of my eye, seeing in it like turning its whole torso around and walking away from us. Oh. It, you know, so it made it. It was only shaking the bushes really to to scare us off. I don't think it meant us any harm whatsoever. Uh, I didn't hit it with the club, thankfully, but um, you know, it wanted to get away from us as much as we did from it. So, but oddly enough, you know, a, a friend of mine, Don Keating, he's a Bigfoot researcher and uh, up in that same area, uh, a couple years after that, you know, he ended up like filming one uh, in an area, maybe 15 miles from, 
from uh, where I had the sighting that I did, and and his was about the same size and white. So I don't know if it's the same one or not, but uh, you know, it's quite the experience. It's the only time that's uh, ever happened to me. Um, so that's amazing. Uh, yeah, that's it's a, something you don't forget. That's for sure. Uh, no, I can imagine. And you know, just the fact of this this creature grabbing the bushes and and shaking them, you know, shows uh, a level of intelligence, right? Uh, oh, yeah. yeah, I mean, it's definitely an intelligent creature, and it, it's definitely out there. I mean, I've witnessed it firsthand, and you know, we uh, Brent uh, Rains, another contributor uh, to my book, had told me and Gene about a report that he took in Tennessee here, and. Uh, of a guy that was uh, in a deer stand and witnessed a craft uh, of some sort landing. And, you know, he claims that a Bigfoot got out of the craft, walked around for a few minutes, uh, and then got back in the craft. And, and then it took off. And, you know, what I, people hear that and are like, yeah, yeah, well, Bigfoot's an alien. He's flying a spacecraft. But I don't think it's like that at all. I mean, I tell people it's like it makes sense to me because – if they're taking us and examining us and you've got some kind of creature out there that's possibly, uh, from all indications, uh, got hu human DNA of some sort, uh, why not? Why would they not take take a creature like that and, and um, uh, examine it as well? Exactly. Exactly. I never, didn't even think about it that way. Yeah. Well, listen, uh, Brett, we're, we're just about out of time here, but I wanted to... Uh, ask you again about where folks can get your book children of the grays well it's on amazon and uh there's a kindle version i, I just got the kindle version uh, up uh, about a week ago so it's a you know it's a print version and a kindle version uh right now it's exclusively uh on amazon okay and uh do you have a website uh, or anything else you'd like to give out tonight or uh, I, I do have a website coming up, just childrenofthegrays.com. I'm putting the finishing touches on that now. Uh, I've got, I just started a Facebook page. Uh, we have a Halo Paranormal, which is what we, the moniker we use for our, our paranormal work that's on Facebook as well. But uh, I started a, uh, a Children of the Grays, uh, it's just uh, facebook.com forward slash Children of the Grays uh, for Facebook. And I, I put it up for people that's interested in the abduction subject and other abductees, you know, to share information. Uh, and, and feel free that they could come out and speak about these things. Uh, and it's, that's, that, that has been happening. You know, we, we're just getting it going, and um, the people that's been joining, uh, I've got some people from all, all, all across the country, you know, that's written me and, and have liked the page and have been participating in it. Um, so I'm happy to see that. Excellent. Excellent. Well, we'll definitely get that information up. Uh, and then lastly, uh, I just want to mention again, if, if the viewers out there, if you get the uh, Destination America channel, uh, and, and that show again was Monsters and Mysteries, is that what it's called? Yeah, Mo Monsters and Mysteries in America. Yeah. And our episode, I believe, is uh, Desert, Desert Wasteland, I think was the, uh, the one we're in, and we're the last, uh, we're the last uh, uh, piece on, on the season finale. The last segment on there, right. And uh, definitely check it out because uh, it is, is a great story. Great story, and uh, you'll get to see, see Brett. All right, Brett, well, listen, uh, thanks very much for coming on. Uh, best of luck on the Children of the Grays and uh, with all the other paranormal stuff you're doing. And uh, maybe come back again sometime and, and give us an update of uh, how things are going. Yeah, I'd love to, Rick. Thanks for uh, having me on. Uh, well, I would love it if you came back. All right. Well, Brett, listen, have a great evening, and uh, we'll stay in touch. All right. Thank you. All right. Good night, Brett. Good night. Good night, everybody. And I wanted people to see what she looks like. And 
but they, they seem to be very interested in uh, uh, us as a physical specimen. I mean, they're very frail. We're not. And uh, also our emotional makeup, you know, what makes us tick. Um, and, and, they'll, and, and it runs the gamut of all, all the emotions that they can elicit from you. And then human sexuality and not so much just the re- reproductive part of it, but the emotions behind it. You know, um, love, love, maybe, I don't know. Love, desire, all of it, you know. Um, and, and, and so they, they will, uh, you know, they've subjected me to that. Um, you know, I've been in things where I've seen other, what I perceive to be humans involved as well, um, sort of in a catatonic state. Uh, and I, maybe I've been in a catatonic state and don't remember it as well, but these are the things that I, that I do remember. And it's all based around, most of everything that they do is based around that. And I think they're using that um, because their hybrids uh, obviously consist of some of that, and they need to learn about it. Well, Brent, let me ask you something. Um, have have these uh, two things. Number one, you said the tall grays actually communicated to you on a couple of occasions. Was this... Uh, uh, you know, through the mind type of communication, or was it verbal communication? And then, second of all, have they ever discussed where they're from with you? Well, it's always telepathic. It's been that that from from the beginning, and and really, uh, some of the uh, some of the early abductions. I mean, I, I didn't really get that. I would still make the mistake of like speaking out loud, and then I would kind of feel kind of foolish by it. But that's just what we're used to, and. Right. And, uh, but I, I quickly realized that, uh, you know, they can read every thought that we're thinking, um, which sometimes can go against you, but, um, I've, I've never asked them where they're from. Um, I, I'm not, I, I'm not even hundred percent sure that they're from another planet. I mean, you know, I do, I think there's a dimensional interdimensional aspect to this. Right. And, uh, I, I do know that when they take me, uh, it's done dimensionally uh, i've seen it uh it took me a, I, I never knew exactly I, I i've heard people talk about other abductees talk about well i went through a wall and stuff like that and that never happened to me i would i, I would see him sometimes where i was at and then the next thing I, I would be black out and then i would wake up and i would be where they took me to but uh a recent episode that happened um a couple of years ago that i heard it like a, a tap 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 sound um uh, on, on the bed, which was going to scare us off that way. So it stood up and faced us. And this thing was, uh, you know, I'm, I'm almost six feet four. And this thing was a good, at least two feet bigger than me. Wow. Um, and we were standing there, just, it just turned around just face to face. Um, and I didn't get a real good look at its face because of the way that, you know, it was a little bit too dark, but it was the typical, you know, cone head, wide shoulders, long arms, but it was just humongous and standing there, uh, 30, 40 feet in front of us, but, um, it was, it was the, f- the fight or flight kind of thing kicked in. And I knew I, that I personally wasn't going to go running back into the woods where we've been lost for the last hour with this thing around. So I, we all screamed basically. And, um, I, I remember like throwing my club at it, which was, uh, I wouldn't do th- these days, but <laughs> as a scared teenager, that's what I did. And we had to run like r- literally right by it to the opening to get to the road. And the funny thing is, is, as we did, I remember like out of the corner of my eye, seeing in it, like turning its whole torso around and walking away from us, oh. it, you know, so it made it, it was only shaking the bushes really to, to scare us off. I don't think it meant us any harm whatsoever. Uh, I didn't hit it with the club, thankfully, but, um, you know, it wanted to get away from us as much as we did from it. So, but oddly enough, you know, a, a friend of mine, Don Keating, he's a Bigfoot researcher and uh, up in that same area. Uh, a couple years after that, you know, he ended up like filming one uh, in an area maybe 15 miles from from uh, where I had the sighting that I did, and and his was about the same size and white. So I don't know if it's the same one or not, but uh, you know, it's quite the experience. It's the only time that's uh, ever happened to me. Um, so that's amazing. Uh, yeah, that's it's a, something you don't forget. That's for sure. Uh, no, I can imagine, and you know, just the fact of this this creature grabbing the bushes and, and shaking them, you know, shows uh, a level of intelligence, right? Uh, oh, yeah. yeah. I mean, it's definitely an intelligent creature and it, it's definitely out there. I mean, I've witnessed it firsthand and, 
you know, we uh, Brent uh, Rains, another contributor uh, to my book, had told me and Gene about a report that he took in Tennessee here, and uh, of a guy that was uh, in a deer stand and witnessed a craft uh, of some sort landing, and you know, he claims that a Bigfoot got out of the craft, walked around for a few minutes. Uh, and then got back in the craft and, and then it took off. And, you know, when I, people hear that and they're like, yeah, yeah, well, Bigfoot's an alien. He's flying a spacecraft. I don't think it's like that at all. I mean, I tell people it's like it makes sense to me because if they're taking us and examining us and you've got some kind of creature out there that's possibly, uh, from all indications, uh, got hu- human DNA of some sort, uh, why not? Why would they not take take a creature like that and, and um uh, examine it as well. Exactly. Exactly. I never, didn't even think about it that way. Yeah. That knew, um, even my wife, um, for the first two years that we were married, you know, I didn't tell her. Oh, is so, that right? Yeah. It was just something that was just, um, it was so traumatic. And, and one of the reasons that I, that I came out with the book was I, I felt it was time to let the public know that this is a, a real thing. It's happening on a grand scale. I mean, ever since the show aired and the books came out, I've got contacted from people like just all over the place from all walks of life having these experiences and too afraid of, of ridicule to to talk to it, talk to anybody about it. And, and that's the kind of thing that I, I want people, I want to be able to help people. I, don't, I suffered in silence for over 20 years uh, once this came out and um, it's just a, it's a lonely existence to live with this kind of uh, psychological trauma um, because it does it does do that and anybody that says it doesn't is is not not yeah. ex- not not in full acceptance of it. Well, let, let me ask you, Brett. Um, did the writing of the book and, and let me make a correction here right off the bat because I think I said that the book came out April of last year, but it was April of this year, correct? Yeah. Correct. Yeah. Oh, okay. So April 2013, it came out. It's a recent release. Okay. Okay. I wanted to make sure I got that right. Now, did the process of writing the book, uh, was it therapeutic to you as far as helping you to get, you know, some of that weight off your shoulders? It was very much so. Um, and actually, it was one of your former guests uh, and a contributor to the book, Sandy Nichols, uh, and my wife, uh, Gina. Who, who both kind of uh, talked me into doing it. Uh, I thought about it, you know, for a while because I just said to myself, I want people to know. I, I have so many memories and a lot more, and a lot to offer and, and stuff that's never been said publicly before that I know of. And, um, and, and I felt that by doing that, um, I could bring more awareness to the public and also maybe give strength and, and comfort to other abductees and Sandy himself is an abductee, and you know he kind of encouraged me, and, and so did Gina. And so finally, I, I just started writing, and it was very therapeutic. And uh, although it took me almost two years to write the book, because once I started reliving, uh, putting it putting it to paper, you know, pen to paper, it's not really pen to paper, but metaphorically speaking, um, it, it, and you start re- kind of reliving the stuff, um, it, it, it sent me into depression several times, and I had to stop and kind of gain my strength again and, um, and get through it. And then I got to a certain point where I was like, okay, I'm going to finish it. And, and that's what happened. But, uh, it, in the end, when it got up, when it was finished and everything was done, it was very therapeutic and I'm, I'm glad I did it. Uh, the destination America channel, uh, it's a new series. And, um, we, we just aired our episode, which was the, uh, the finale of the season, um, a couple of weeks ago. And I think they're, they're already starting to show repeats of it. We went out to Vegas. Uh, I'm from, uh, not originally, but I lived in Las Vegas for over 20 years. And um, they were doing an episode um, on monsters and different kind of uh, paranormal events and stuff that happened in the desert. So uh, that's where some of my uh, abduction experiences have taken place. So they flew, my wife and I, uh, out to Las Vegas, and we filmed out there in December. And um, they covered... um, a little bit of the beginning of my abduction experiences, starting when I was five years old, and they, uh, the main the main thing they were covering was uh, an episode that I had that, uh, in the late '80s uh, with uh, an ex girlfriend of mine. 
and I were living together and we had uh, been awakened in the night by a loud bang. We woke up um, to see, I saw four, she saw three because one was blocked from her view, uh, gray aliens, the grays as they're typically called, uh, uh, surrounding us. And um, we were taken together. Um, we were taken aboard the craft at the time. She was uh, about a week shy of being four months pregnant. Uh. And um, they put us on separate tables. Uh, of all my, I've been having abduction experiences uh, since I was five years old. And uh, of all the times I've been taken, which is uh, a multitude of times, I've never seen this many uh, of them together. And they were surrounding my table, and they were surrounding hers, and she was over by some equipment. But they had her up um, basically same way, uh, like stirrups and stuff, as, as an OBGYN would do. Right. And they were removing the fetus from her. Um, I realized what was happening at the time. Uh, basically, I was helpless to do anything about it because of the control that these uh, creatures have over you. And um, I tried to, I was able to move my head, but nothing else. And they had left the right side of my body open. So giving me a clear view on purpose, it seemed like. And I, I did turn my head away. Um, she was she was screaming, please don't take my baby, please stop. And, and, and hysterical, as you might imagine. And um, I, I was screaming at them too. I turned my head away. I didn't want to watch it anymore because I realized what was happening. And uh, one of them came around the top of the table and put his hand over the top of my head and uh, turned my head back to the rays. Well, it's on Amazon, and uh, there's a Kindle version. I, I just got the Kindle version uh, up uh, about a week ago, so it's a you know it's a print version and a Kindle version. Uh, right now, it's exclusively uh, on Amazon. Okay. And uh, do you have a website uh, or anything else you'd like to give out? tonight or uh, I, I do have a website coming up just children of the grays dot com I'm putting the finishing touches on that now uh, I've got I just started a Facebook page uh, we have a halo paranormal which is what we the moniker we use for our, our paranormal work that's on Facebook as well but uh, I started a, uh, a children of the grays uh, it's just uh, facebook.com forward slash children of the grays uh, for Facebook and I, I put it up for people that's interested in the abduction subject and other abductees, you know, to share information uh, and, and feel free that they could come out and speak about these things. Uh, and it's, that's, that, that has been happening. You know, we, we're just getting it going. And um, the people that's been joining, uh, I've got some people from all, all, all across the country, you know, that's written me and, and have liked the page and have been participating in it. Um, so I'm happy to see them. Excellent. Excellent. Well, we'll definitely get that information up. Um, and then lastly, uh, I just want to mention again, if, if the viewers out there, if you get the uh, Destination America channel, uh, and, and that show again was Monsters and Mysteries, is that what it's called? Yeah, Mo Monsters and Mysteries in America. Yeah. And our episode, I believe, is uh, Desert, Desert Wasteland, I think was the, uh, the one we're in, and we're the last, uh, we, we're the last uh, uh, piece on, on the season finale. The last segment on there, right. And uh, definitely check it out because uh, it is, is a great story. Great story, and uh, you'll get to see, see Brett. All right, Brett, well, listen, uh, thanks very much for coming on. Uh, best of luck on Children of the Greys and uh, with all the other paranormal stuff you're doing. And uh, maybe come back again sometime and, and give us an update of uh, how things are going. Yeah, I'd love to, Rick. Thanks for uh, having me on. Uh, well, I would love it if you came back. All right. Well, Brett, listen, have a great evening, and uh, we'll stay in touch. All right. Thank you. All right. Good night, Brett. Good night. Good night, everybody. is to keep it you believe it when you find something screaming across your mind green slime 
they were probably taking me through. I, I tend to think uh, that a lot of this stuff is definitely dimensional. Um, it just it just seems like a, a logical explanation to me. What, um, like you said, that that uh, these experiences you've had have has caused you to become extremely interested in other paranormal, ghost hunting, um, uh, cryptozoology. Now, I understand you had some type of run-in with Bigfoot. Um, or is I, that something you don't want to get into right now? No, it's, it's fine. I can briefly tell you about it. It's, um, I, don't, I don't really think it was anything related to uh, my abduction experiences, but I do think the, uh, the, the, the connection between uh, abductees and, and ghost activity, um, through my research, I found time and time again, that going all the way back to Betty and Barney Hill, you know, Kathleen Martin, who's uh, one of the contributors of my book, you know, niece of Betty, uh, Betty Hill. And she even said that after, after their uh, experience, they started experiencing paranormal activity around their house. So th there's a definite connection there uh, with that. Briefly, uh, you know, my, my thing with the Bigfoot sighting, I, I lived, I went to high school in Northeast Ohio, which is a Bigfoot hotspot. And uh, me and two of my friends had, uh, after school uh, one spring, decided to go check out this old abandoned house that everybody was telling us about. And, you know, there was a famous myth about it where they found this couple uh, dead in there and they had fear locked on their face. <laughs> you know, one of those things the high school kids right, talk about. Right, right. Uh, so we, we uh, went all these back roads and it went, got all the way down to like dirt roads. And then we started going down the dirt road and the, there was a log across the road and we kind of couldn't go anymore. So we hiked and we got up through there um, and heard a bunch of dogs barking, which we assumed were wild dogs because there was nothing really around there. So we uh, made little clubs uh, out of some tree branches and started hitting the trees. Well, unbeknownst to me at the time, that's a, a mode of communication for Bigfoot. Right. Um, you know, the tree banging. And so I, I, I guess we must have called it to us by doing that. We were just check, checking the sturdiness of the branches in case the dogs, wild dogs attacked us. So uh, we, we kind of stood still for a while and we heard the dogs kind of coming around the other side. And we're like, well, we like back where the car was at. And we're like, well, we can't go back that way. We might run into them. So we decided to kind of go around the long way. We went through this big pine forest and, and ended up getting lost, basically. And uh, the sun started going down. It started getting pretty dark. And finally, uh, after meandering around for about an hour, uh, we were walking in single file. And I was walking first. And uh, I found a deer that far along uh, in the pregnancy that there should have been, even with a normal miscarriage, there should have been some kind of tissue left in there. And he said the womb was completely clean. It was like this woman was never pregnant. And he says, I know better because she was just in my office. I, I believe it was four or five days before that. She had been in his office and had an exam. And, uh, and he was just, he was just total stunned by it. And my mom, uh, heard that and actually Dustin, uh, the Mr. Monsters and Mysteries, uh, interviewed her as well, um, as to what she had witnessed to the doctor saying that, and they, we, we were able to find, uh, the girl that I'm talking about. I hadn't spoken to her in at least 15 years and I wasn't, uh, all I had, uh, talked to her before that we did the television show was, did you, do you remember this? Because after it happened, uh, we were both just, we, we had both talked about it. We had, both of us had remembered what had happened the night before. And, and it was just one of those things we were just kind of like in, in, in shock. And, um, you know, we just, we just knew that what had happened, there was nothing we could do about it. And we just kind of let it go. And we, we talked about it briefly a couple more times, but, um, that was it. And she told me that, she did remember it and that she still li basically lives in fear of, a, of them coming back and sleeps with the light on to this day when she goes to bed and uh, she agreed to, to, uh, to be interviewed. So uh, I had no idea at the time, like what details that she did remember about it. Um, and what they interviewed us at separate times, um, at separate locations. And when they got done interviewing her, I asked the, uh, the uh, director, uh, you know, how, how it went. He says, well, you know, she backed up your story 100%. So uh, I tell you, um, I saw, uh, I saw her, you know, giving her, her interview part. 
and uh, you could just tell by the look on her face that uh, this was still very much affecting her. Uh, I guess she's kept it a secret all this time, I guess up till just now when she did that interview. Is, is that correct? As far as I know, um, I mean, I, I did the same thing. Um, you know, I, I've had these abduction experiences. I, I wasn't aware of them um, until my 20s, and I began having anxiety attacks for absolutely no reason. I mean, I was an athlete when I was younger. I've been a musician my whole life, uh, you know, played thousands of shows. Uh, used to <laughs> Not the type of person that really gets anxiety attacks. And um, I started having severe anxiety attacks, which I had to get therapy for. And through the therapy, and um, I, I never got regressed, you know, like some people do for abduction experiences, but uh, I did I, I did get into therapy and, and started learning relaxation to, and then it took off. And you know, when I, people hear that and they're like, yeah, yeah, well, Bigfoot's an alien, he's flying a spacecraft. But I don't think it's like that at all. I mean, I tell people it's like it makes sense to me because if they're taking us and examining us and you've got some kind of creature out there that's possibly, uh, from all indications, uh, got hu human DNA of some sort, uh, why not? Why would they not take take a creature like that and, and um, uh, examine it as well? Exactly. Exactly. I never, didn't even think about it that way. Yeah. Well, listen, uh, Brett, we're, we're just about out of time here, but I wanted to uh, ask you again about where folks can get your book, Children of the Greys. Well, it's on Amazon, and uh, there's a Kindle version. I, I just got the Kindle version uh, up uh, about a week ago, so it's a you know it's a print version and a Kindle version. Uh, right now, it's exclusively uh, on Amazon. Okay, and uh, do you have a website uh, or anything else you'd like to give out tonight? Or uh, I, I do have a website coming up, just childrenofthegrays.com. I'm putting the finishing touches on that now. Uh, I've got. I just started a Facebook page. Uh, we have a Halo Paranormal, which is what we the moniker we use for our, our paranormal work. That's on Facebook as well. But uh, I started a, uh, a Children of the Grays. Uh, it's just uh, Facebook.com forward slash Children of the Grays uh, for Facebook, and I, I put it up for people that's interested in the abduction subject and other abductees. You know, to share information. Uh, and, and feel free that they could come out and speak about these things. Uh, and it's, that's, that, that has been happening. You know, we, we're just getting it going. And um, the people that's been joining, uh, I've got some people from all, all, all across the country, you know, that's written me and, and have liked the page and have been participating in it. Um, so I'm happy to see them. Excellent. Excellent. Well, we'll definitely get that information up. Um, and then lastly, uh, I just want to mention again, if, if the viewers out there, if you get the uh, Destination America channel, uh, and, and that show again was Monsters and Mysteries, is that what it's called? Yeah, Mo Monsters and Mysteries in America. Yeah. And our episode, I believe, is uh, Desert, Desert Wasteland, I think was the, uh, the one we're in, and we're the last, uh, we, we're the last uh, uh, piece on, on the season finale. The last segment on there, right. And uh, definitely check it out because uh, it is, is a great story. Great story, and uh, you'll get to see, see Brett. All right, Brett, well, listen, uh, thanks very much for coming on. Uh, best of luck on the Children of the Greys and uh, with all the other paranormal stuff you're doing. And uh, maybe come back again sometime and, and give us an update of uh, how things are going. Yeah, I'd love to, Rick. Thanks for uh, having me on. Uh, well, I...